Okay. So Abunas, I think uh, one of the Abunas can start. Um, okay. But um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. If any of the Abunas or anyone, quick prayer, if anyone wants to share. Okay, Tanya, I, I will start if you Thank don't you. mind. Of Morabuna, yes, of course. Hello. Good evening, Shamos or Gabriel. Shano. Good evening, everybody. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we are grateful and thankful to your love. And tonight, we are thankful for our gathering. We gather every night around your word. Our prayer uh, tonight, asking your Holy Spirit to come upon our meeting, our gathering, our group, and especially through our brother, Shamusu Gabriel, speak with him and with us to glorify your love your glory and to to, to arrive uh, together to glorify your name father son holy spirit one true god amen amen Clergy members, good evening, everyone. Shlomo, uh, first, I would like uh, to thank Tanya for putting this session together. And thank her for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, in tonight's session, I am going to talk about how to understand Syriac Christian theology and liturgy through the lens of music and hymns. I would like to give you a quick background before we get started. Uh, my name is Gabriel Aydin. I was born and raised in Turabdi in Turkey. I received my Christian education, Syriac language and chant and music at the monastery of Ter Zafar and Mardin, and then um, at Mor Gabriel Diad. After I attended the musical conservatory in Istanbul. Later, I went to Lebanon to receive a higher education in musicology and focused on religious music. Um, I received my master's degree and later diploma of profound studies from the Holy Spirit University of Kaslik, Lebanon. In 2013, I graduated from Yale University's Divinity School and Yale. Uh, Institute of Sacred Music. This summer, I will be receiving my PhD doctorate diploma in musicology, sacred music from the Holy Spirit University. I am also the founder and director of the Syriac Music Institute located here in Rhode Island. Finally, I just published Syriac Hymnal, which provides musical transcription of hymn melodies, Syriac text, and English translation of all hymns practiced throughout the church. It's a book for everyone to have at home through which you can chant, read, and understand Syriac Christian theology, faith, and music. So to begin, I would like to chant a hymn in Syriac as an offering of praise, which is an essential element in the life of a Christian, a Saint Jacob of Seroch, who was called the flute of the Holy Spirit, would say. Here, I would like to share the hymn with you so you can join me. <clears throat> <laughs> كلهن رغشاي بزمورايه هو أختل شوب حوخ مثقن ليشون من شورايه هو وين هود بوطي من تشبح توخ لغدوش هوي Son of God, stir up my voice for your glory. With their songs, may all my senses sing your praise. From the beginning, my tongue was created for your glory. Were not to praise you, it would deserve punishment. <clears throat> so to most of us, the use of music in liturgy is just an ornament or decoration that accompanies him text and not aware of the intent of its use nor its power and importance as one of the main components of the Syriac liturgy. So in today's session, I am going to explain the role of music and chant in the Syriac liturgy and how the employment of music to liturgy helps us understand Christian theology. So you may have noticed that I am using the term chant, but the term chant I refer to the traditional hymns and their melodies of the Bethgazo, the treasury of chants, which are composed 
by the Syriac Church Fathers throughout the golden era of Syriac literature and liturgical composition, which spans from the 4th to the 8th century. And singing of chanting these ancient hymns and their melodies a cappella. In other words, singing Syriac hymns without the accompaniment of any musical instrument, just the human voice. This is because the Church Fathers believe that singing is the highest form human expression. So the whole spectrum of the Syriac church liturgical activities, such as the gathering of the members of the church, prayer, chanting, baptismal ceremony, the divine liturgy, the gospel reading, the incense, icons, taking communion, giving and receiving peace, deacons on the altar, and two gude, lecterns, one on each side, and many other elements define the character of the Syriac liturgy. Music has a special place among all these liturgical actions through which we experience, one, how music gives voice to the heart of prayer and interprets the very meaning of the Syriac Christian doctrine and faith. Two, through music we are able to interpret biblical narrative, and three, through music and proper chanting, we can meditate and experience different spiritual levels. Throughout my talk tonight, I will focus on these three crucial points. It's clear that all Syriac liturgical rites, texte, for example, texto da modo, the baptismal rite, are structured through music. And through music and liturgical activities, we are able to understand Christian theology. These three entities, which are crucial in uh, characterizing the Christian faith always function together and also form the ba basis of a unique form of worship and liturgical tradition of the Syriac Church. The Syriac Church, in addition to the Syriac Aramaic language spoken by our Lord, identifies itself musically. In other words, people can distinguish the Syriac Church from other churches mainly through the kind of music that is employed in its liturgy. It's also true that Hymn text can be understood without music, but it, it will take a longer to process and understand the theology that lays behind the text. Music facilitates the understanding of the deep theological meaning of the text and enables the word of God to enter our hearts and minds easily. It's like when a child rides his bike on a hill and struggles to get to the top of the hill, then somebody comes, gently gives him a boost then the child easily gets to the top of the hill. So we start our story of music practice with the scripture. Singing is emphasized in both the Old and New Testament. After escaping from the Egyptians and crossing the Red Sea, the Israelites started singing so a song to the Lord with an accompaniment of a musical instrument. For example, we read in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verses 20 through 21. And here I would like um, Daniel Hanna to read us verse. Shalom, 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 how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank God. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Thank you, Cody. So singing was also practiced by Jesus and his disciples. Matthew, in his gospel, says, after Jesus and his disciples had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 30. Also, the apostle Paul, Paul instructed the Colossian, where he says, and here I would like um, Noor Babalos to read uh, the English verse for us. No, Masha, Masha. Um, so here is 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and ad ad admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So the role of music in worship is biblical. So be before I delve into the discussion, I would like to ask the following questions through which I will shape my talk. Why do we consider Syriac liturgical music as sacred? Why did Syriac church fathers like St. Ephraim, St. Jacob, St. Balai, use music to supplement their hymns. As Syriac Christians, how do we regard music in the liturgy? 
how much do we know about music being used in the Syriac liturgy? By labeling Syriac music as sacred, I refer to music as being used as a sacred vessel or instrument by the church fathers to transmit the Christian message and to distribute Christian faith among non-believers, known as Gentiles, and also for believers so they can strengthen their faith in Jesus Christ. Here I would like to share with you um, an image. So the term in this image, um, I will, uh, this image exemplifies the theory that I'm going to explain just in a moment. So the term sacred music is formed through a combination of two sacred elements, text, and sound or music. To further explain this, just as speech and sound are one in the act of singing, Syriac chant or hymn combines meltho, the, the, the sacred word or text, with qolu, sound or music, and each component providing the other with divine potency. So this synthesis or mixture gives birth to what we call sacred music. In Syriac liturgical tradition, the music is understood to be an extension of the word rather than purely an ornamentation. Music after the text is the second crucial component that shapes chants of the Syriac musical tradition. So the Syriac Orthodox prelate Barabroyo, who lived in the 13th century, Barabroyo also known as Abu Faraj in Arabic language, in his book called Etikon, refers to music that accompanies the text as an instrument to understand the spiritual aspect of chant text, where he says, It translates, music or singing is a great help to understand the word of the spiritual praises. It's clear that the Syriac church fathers perceived music as a sacred art to dress up their poetical works, which are drawn upon sacred biblical texts. When the melody is intermingled with sacred texts, a musical liturgical phenomena is formed, known as sacred chant. To further explain why and how St. Ephraim and other hymnographers used music in their poetry, we can say the following. In the early centuries of Christianity, one of the most crucial ways to spread Christianity was through music and chanting. This is true especially when dealing with simple or ordinary people who were in terms of education illiterate, who couldn't read and write. As you may know, back then education was only for the elite. Syriac fathers therefore utilized music as a sacred and sacred art and started transmitting Christian faith by having people memorizing songs and praises and hoping that by the repetition of these hymns, they would understand the theological meaning behind the text. This concept worked perfectly. And until today, we use this concept not only to learn our chants, but also to understand our Christian faith. Since a large portion of chants were composed for ordinary people, chant texts are deliberately simple, such that they can be easily comprehended by diverse and ordinary communities of believers and monastics. More Dionysius Barsalibi, the metropolitan of Amid or Diyarbakir in the 12th century, who provided a commentary on the entire Bible and the liturgy, writes concerning the chants contained in the Shehimu, the daily office, saying, this book was prepared for chanting by the simple worshippers and monastics. This is why its compiler chose simple verses, which would immediately be assimilated by the mind and would move the heart. As the early church fathers found, and as worshiping communities find even today, the regular heartfelt communal singing is simple hymns prepares the faithful to receive the word of God. When we look at St. Ephraim's hymns, Madroshe, for instance, we see that they often come with a refrain. In Syriac, we call it Unitho, in Arabic, Alazmi, or in Turkish, Nakarat while a deacon sings a solo part and then people would respond with a simple refrain. Here I would like to share uh, this um, image with you where he says Okay, I would like someone to read the English uh, translation, please. Tanya? Yes. Uh, Maryam, if you are out here. No one quite knows 
Lord, what to call your mother? Should we call her a virgin? But her giving birth is an established fact or a married woman, but no man has known her. If your mother's case is beyond comprehension, who can hope to understand yours? Praise to you whom all things are easy, for you are the Almighty. Thank you very much. So here um, we see that as human beings, we cannot comprehend Mary's situation, Mary's case. And how can we understand Jesus or God's you know, case. This is the first stanza of St. Ephraim's Madrosho, Hymns on the Nativity. In the following stanza, St. Ephraim goes on to explain the nativity concept in detail. Another main reason that the church fathers allowed spiritual praises to be performed in the way of songs, which are supplemented by melodies and music, is explained by Barabroyo, who states that singing, because of its sweetness, lightens and facilitates the burden of ascetical labors as it keeps the senses from feeling time and motion. That's why chant or singing has been a component of group worship practice of monastic communities, such as the monastery of Mor Gabriel or Der Zafran, Qanishrin, or Mormatta in Mosul, Iraq. So these monastic communities consider chant to be like a prayer an exercise in spiritual formation. It's worth noting that Syriac chant tradition has survived and been transmitted orally throughout generations through these monastic communities. They have been the main channels for preserving and transmitting Syriac chants from getting lost. So how do chants convey the biblical narratives, Syriac Christian doctrine and faith? Having briefly described the reason why Syriac fathers supplemented their poetical works with music, now we will see how these chants can convey biblical narrative, Syriac Christian doctrine and faith. Today, liturgy is the main category through which we learn the Syriac Christian theology faith. To describe this further, I would like to give the divine liturgy as an example. The Syriac liturgy can be regarded as a sacred icon, just as an icon is a window into the reality of God. Liturgy is a sacred icon of the Syriac church. For example, when you walk into the church during the celebration of the divine liturgy of Qorobu al you will see the assembled community which consists of lay faithful along with ordained deacons of varying ranks, such as Mzamrone, Qoruye, Afudiakne, and Mshamshone Evangeloye, and Rishim Mshamshone and also clergy members of different orders such as Qashisho, Khuroyo, or Hasyu are present. They are gathered around for the celebration of the liturgy of the word in which they hear the readings from the Holy Bible and the homily and then move to the celebration of the Eucharistic anaphora to receive the Holy Communion, Urbono the sacred body and blood of our Lord Jesus. The smell of incense, the sound of the small bells attached to the farmo, the sound of the cymbals jiggled by deacons on both sides, the priest washing of his hands and waving the veil over the sacraments while invoking the Holy Spirit to come down to bless the sacrament, and the chanting in alternate manners between two groups, or gude, all together are part of this icon which in turn represents the Syriac liturgy. So music finds itself in all these activities. It helps the liturgy to be a window into the soul of the church. Not only does it shape the liturgy, but also helps us understand theological reasoning behind every action and the meaning of the text used in the liturgy. To begin to explore the significance and unique contribution of music, therefore, one has to look at the way the liturgy is theology. A living theology, it is worship. Liturgy is where theology meets everyday lives and where people respond to the invitation to become part of God's salvation history. Let us select a few musical examples from various feasts and occasions and analyze them together. The first one will be from the baptismal rite in the Syriac tradition or texto da'amodu. St. Ephraim expands Syriac Christian theological definitions through the vehicle of poetry, mainly through his memory and madroshi. In his hymn on virginity, St. Ephraim explores a variety of themes, among which the theme of baptismal oil in Syriac Meshach. St. Ephraim refers to the baptismal oil as a metaphor of Christ, Mshihu, the anointed one. And in the stanzas that follows, he emphasizes the practice of the Syriac pre-baptismal anointing and follow it immediately by the baptism in the water, which he described as the second womb 
that gives new birth to God's children. This theology is reflected in a hymn called Mshihu Mishhu Ishtota in a Fremic Slavic meter seven plus seven. I would like to chant this hymn for you. It's only one short stanza. Here I can probably pause the uh, the text for you. So Mshihu Mishhu Ishtota Kaseyo Begeliyo Ithmazakh مشحو موشح قليوي مشيحو روشيم كسيوي امري وحاثي وروحوني قزورو دتري نصحونا بطني قرمين غو مشحو مولو ديمين غو مايو I would like uh, my to read this. Christ and oil are combined. The hidden is mingled in the pot. The oil anoints openly. Christ marks the new and spiritual lambs, a flock of double triumphs. For its conception is out of oil, but its birth is... Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> so in later stanzas of this Madrosho, St. Ephraim gives an overall view of baptism in the Syriac tradition. The anointing, the consecration of the baptismal water, affected by the Holy Spirit hovering over it, the war of baptism officiated by the priest who is assisted by deacons, and finally, the communion, which is an integral part of the baptismal service in the Syriac-speaking church, as opposes to the first communion in the Catholic church. Here, in this stanza, when I say the Holy Spirit hovering over it, this refers to Genesis um, 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the world. So in this Madrosho, St. Ephraim was able to explain the entire baptismal tradition of the Syriac Church. This confirms the theory I offered earlier, that the theological character of the Syriac liturgical chant is not only a vessel that connects us with ancient Syriac writings of the church doctors, but also a liturgical art that transmits Syriac church history, doctrine, liturgy, theology, and spirituality. Let us take an example from the Holy Week, Hamshud Rosi, that describes a biblical narrative. So Hamshud Rosi is also known in English as Maundy Thursday. As Syriac Christians, we believe that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, that the sacrifice of Golgotha, which means a site immediately outside Jerusalem's walls where Jesus was crucified, is repeated at every Eucharistic celebration, and we receive him in Holy Qurbon, communion, as food unto eternal life. So when we look at scripture, Luke 22, verse 15, our Lord says, I have earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you. Also in Mark 14, verses 22 through 26, we, all, we, we also hear the words of institution in Syriac, Mele Usuyutu. Here I would like um, Sarah or Lucas Baho to read the verse. In Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. Okay, go ahead, Lucas. As, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said take eat this is my body then he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and they all drank from it and he said to them this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many surely i say to you i will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drank it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So Thank you, Samosa. Mark, no problem, Sarah. So here, Luke and Mark, one assured us that the Last Supper in the upper room was a Passover meal. And two, Jesus puts an end to animal sacrifice by saying, this is my body. This cup is the blood and the new covenant. Therefore, we have no more sacrificial offerings or ceremonies. This narrative is summarized in the following hymn, 
which is said according to the melody of the Bo'uthu or supplication of Mor Yaqub the Sruq and sung during the feast of Hamshad Rose, Monday, Thursday in the Holy Week. Here I would like to pause an image for you so all. So Bayt al-Marqus shalim kulhin aati quthu wabhaw lillu klul sakinu min haywuthu tamun kthabu diya thiqas kul hathuthu washru batil kul eresis then the following stanza, which also complements the first one, it says, In Mark's house, he fulfilled the entire Old Testament. On that night, he put an end to animal sacrifice. There he wrote the entire New Testament and abolished every deceitful heresy. He broke his body and divided it for his 12 apostles. If they had not seen him breaking his body, they would not have broken it. The high priest rose to serve his disciples. So this hymn shows the fulfillment of the old in the New Testament. These hymns draw a clear line between the old and the New Testament. St. Ephraim explores the typological relationships between the Passover lamb of Exodus 12 and Christ and the new Passover lamb. This true lamb, he says, is seen as the, as the fulfillment of the Passover lamb on two different worlds. In the world of the living, he leads the people or Gentiles out of the error of paganism, while in the domain of Shul or Shul in Syriac, he leads out the dead. And beginning at the very moment of the crucifixion, as he read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 52, where it says, the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Another example which complements the previous one, but this narrative is used metaphorically. As you may know, imagery in a common, is a common characteristic of Syriac chants. A type of imagery is a metaphor, which is a figurative expression that comes from a part, uh, forms a part of the language of poetry in Syriac tradition. So metaphors are found in every liturgical service of the Syriac tradition. For example, the Qolo in the Friday morning service of the Shehimu, the daily office, reads, Brishya daslibo, I can share again this with you, sorry. Brishya daslibo abadhyu dhoi ma'asarto wa'asarbo s'ghulu t'burkthu wa'asrui ulotamui. Qabil thayidat qudshu u kul yum mene mithbasmu. Hallelujah. He yelled a'dham al-ulam kul yum shubhu l'isamru. Here I would like my son Ephraim now uh, to read the English uh, translation of these. Go ahead. Um, on top of the cross, the Jews the Jews made a wine press and pressed in it the grape of blessing. They pressed it, but they did not taste of it. The Holy Church received it, and every day she takes her pleasure. Hallelujah. And her children every day forever sing praise to him. Thank you, Todi Ephraim. <clears throat> so this hymn, this chant, interprets the cross is likened to a wine press. The Jews who crucified Jesus are likened to a wine makers. Jesus is linked to a grape. And Jesus' blood is likened to wine. Thus, it bears an intentional liturgical and sacramental implication. Here, I would like to give another, um, uh, give you another example, uh, a biblical narrative example, which is a hymn that you all know and love. And here, I would like to have um, Miriam Yohanun. I believe she is the daughter of Father Yaqub Yohanun from Chicago. Uh, to Chant for us, Toyson Wathyun. I can post it on the screen. Here we go. Go ahead, Miriam. So, Toyson Wathyun, Lothyun, Fayoto, Wabawe, Faroe, Shafir, Adamaito, Taino, Shamoe, Nesaito. Taino liyuhanu, hoida talo, taino li, hauda taino Thank you very much. That was beautiful. 
Miriam. It was beautiful, beautiful chanting. So this is a Syriac hymn for Advent. In Syriac, Advent is called Zabnut Suboru, referring to the six Sundays leading to Christmas. The hymn is based on stories from the Holy Bible. It refers to three women from the Bible and the miraculous birth of their children. The first woman is Hannah, the mother of Samuel. The second is Elizabeth, the mother of John, the Baptist. And the third one is Mary, the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let us now look at the beautiful stories of these three great mothers and their significant children. Hannah, the mother of Samuel. We read about Hannah in the Bible, the first book of Samuel in the Old Testament. Hannah was married but did not have children. One day Hannah went up to the temple and prayed with great sorrow. In her prayer, she asked God for a son. And in return, she vowed to give the son back to God for the service of God. God heard her prayer, and a year later, she gave birth to a son whom she named Samuel. Hannah gave Samuel to Israel's chief priest, Eli, to be raised as a Nazarite. After being raised by the priest Eli in the temple, Samuel becomes God's main prophet in Israel. Here, Nazarite, um, which means in Hebrew, Nazar, or to abstain from or to consecrate oneself to. In Syriac, we call it nedro or nadro. Like we say, when someone, nodr abro medide lmede aulieto aulidero. For example, when a couple who cannot have children, um, they go to a monastery that has uh, a known saint and pray uh, so God would give them a child. And the parents would voluntarily take a vow uh, that if God gave them a son, they would name him after that saint and they, would, and they wouldn't cut his hair until the vow is completed. So we call it Nadro in Syriac. So to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, we also find the story of Elizabeth in the Bible, in the New Testament. In the time of Herod king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. His wife was called Elizabeth. Both of them were honest and good in the eyes of God and observing all the Lord's commandments, but they did not have children. One day when the priest Zechariah was praying in the temple of the Lord, the angel appeared to him and said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many on the people of Israel to the Lord of God. Luke 1, verses 13 through 16. Now Mary, Mary the mother of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mary was a young girl, probably only about 12 or 13 years old, when, she, when the angel Gabriel came to her. She had recently became engaged to a carpenter named Joseph. We read in the Gospel of Luke and Matthew that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most. So when we reflect about the hymn, we notice that two of the women, namely Hannah and Elizabeth, were barren. They could not have children. And the third one, Mary, was a virgin. All three gave birth to sons who became very significant in the history and salvation of our world. Samuel was a great prophet in God, uh, of God in Israel. John became the foreigner who prepared the way for Christ. He baptized Jesus in the river of Jordan. Jesus the awaited Messiah, the Son of Most High, was born of the Virgin Mary and saved the world through his unconditional love. As we can see, this hymn connects the Old Testament to the New Testament and draws a line between these three biblical figures. As I mentioned earlier, a large number of Syriac chants were composed to nurture the faith of the ordinary faithful or the new believers, the majority of which were illiterate, did not know how to read and write. Through chance, they were introduced Christian faith. Another example from the Shehimo, the daily office, which complements the previous examples, but this one is about supplication and repentance, or Boutho in Syria. In the compline of the second day, Sutur the Trim Shabo, uh, where it says, Lomor emuth bahtohai, men horkum qarib no loch demad ainai, shuhdo drohemat, lo taurim qarib no loch, ulo emre of luk dayo, ulo shufnine of lubne yon.
ترتن طوف من عيني أخ حطيت بثشمع قابلين فرح حوب دابو يلوذخ وبصلوث دهيدي لذخ هاليلويا حاسوليح I can sing just the first line for you and I can share it with you so you can see here we go لو موري مثبح طهي من هلكم قريب نلوخ دميد عيني شو حدود روحي ما لو توري مقريب نلوخ ولو امري افلوك ذا يولو شوفني افلوكنا يوني ترتن طوف من عيني أخحطيت تدبيس شمون قابلين وفرح ملاي حوب داب ويولو ذوخ وبصلو ثود هيدي لتوخ هاليلو يا حاسولي حوباي I would like my son Simon to read the English of Simon. Lord, let me not die in my sins. Now I offer you the tears of my eyes, a bribe that you love. I do not offer oxen, lambs, goats, doves, or young pigeons, but rather a pair of tears of my like the sinful woman in the house of Simon. Accept them and have mercy upon By the love of the Father who begot you, and by the prayer of her who bore you. Hallelujah. Give me... Thank you, Todis. Thank you. So in this hymn, we can see the tradition of animal sacrifice and offering doves in the temple, which were main activities in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Testament, however, all these activities were replaced with genuine prayers and supplication. In other words, the prayer replaces the sacrificial animal of, of the Old Testament. The faithful now offer their earnest prayer as a spiritual sacrifice to the merciful Lord in the purity of the heart and tears of repentance on the interior altar of the heart. We do this in the manner of the sinful woman who washed the feet of Jesus with her tears, wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Luke 7 verses 36 through 50. Before I offer examples from the Divine Liturgy, Holy Corbono, a brief explanation of phases and musical settings of the Divine Liturgy will be helpful. Among numerous rites and sacraments, music and singing occupy an integral part in the formation of the divine of the Syriac divine liturgy. As the musical and poetical work of the Syriac poet theologian, as an Ephraim, suggests music has always served a ministerial function and engages the entire church to participate in the holy mystery. Diverse prayer formulations, chants in various types and genres, and short responses which are sung as a solo or collectively by the people set in variable musical settings, the Syriac liturgy. As more Dionysius Barsalibi suggests, let it be known to you that the Syriac writers show the mystery of every festival in the words of the office, which they read for, uh, wrote for it. And they wove all its history in the Qinothu modes in order to teach the hearers the mystery of festival. This is how more Dionysius Barsalibi describes the formation of Syriac chants and their characteristics as well as the way they form the basis for the Syriac liturgical service. The Syriac service is so rich in chants of various types and genres that one cannot think of a celebration without. Here I'm going to post another image which um, contains the six uh, phases of the uh, divine liturgy. So the liturgy comprises of variety um, of different forms of prayer, each requiring a different chant from chant form for musical expression. And the main sense of chants which are employed in the liturgical observance are one, chants that are immediately connected to the liturgical actions, for example, Qdomodium Rahmonu, Qadish Qadish, Motokh Moran, or Rahim Alain, which have a fixed melody and text. Two, hymns that are changeable according to the occasion, for example, Qolud Bothar Evangelion, or Qathuliqi, in the middle of the Mass, or Hutomu, concluding hymn, 
which mainly highlights the theme of that particular occasion. And three, short responses, a dialogue such as Amruha Diloch and Litany of the Deacons, which are short supplicatory prayers sung by the deacons on behalf of others. This should usually take place right after we chant Qathuliqi. And four, uh, for psalms and other types chant. Here I would like to pause, I guess. <clears throat> okay, so now um, I'm going to show how the divine liturgy is formed. So the second we enter the church, we recite Ethel with Aloho, well worth Aloho, the Mhade Taluth. Here I can show you that image of you. Then that short psalm follows by another um, biblical verse where it says, So then after we um, recite Psalm 43, verse 4, and then from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, we start with a chant called Nuhruh Huzina Nuhruh, by your light. This hymn is also recited by the celebrant while the candles of the left side of the altar are to be lit. This hymn is based on a verse of John's Gospel where Christ says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8 verse 12. Here John clarif clarifies that unlike any other source of light, which is a type of the true light, where is no darkness in Christ. When the candles on the right side of the altar are lit during other verses of this hymn, which reflect biblical narratives, when Abel offered the best portion from his born of his flock to God in Genesis 4 verse 4. This sacrifice is a type of the sacrifice of the firstborn of God, Jesus, on the cross for salvation on the world. Also Noah offered a sacrifice to God, after which God vowed to never destroy the earth again due to man's wickedness. We see this in Genesis 8 verses 20 through 21. Abraham offered his only son Isaac to God. So each stanza of this hymn is inspired by biblical narrative. <clears throat> All this occur in the first phase to Yobo of the divine liturgy I just uh, posted um, on your screen. So the second phase a phase of the divine liturgy repre represents a pre-anaphora of the liturgy focuses on the teaching uh, and doctrine of the faith. As you may know, the anaphora starts after reciting the creed, Abu Wahid. In the second phase of the liturgy, we see that the liturgy begins as the curtain is drawn open, which marks the revelation um, of the incarnation of our Lord, uh, Lord to the world. So this phase of the divine liturgy historically was devoted to those who weren't baptized, called catechumens, which means a Christian convert under instruction before baptism. And after this phase, the catechumens would, have, would leave, so the celebration can continue with, most, uh, with those who were only baptized. As we can see, every part, every chant and prayer contained in the divine liturgy is connected to the scripture. The traditional understanding of the sacred music in the liturgy is that chants must represent a higher form of spirituality, both musically and textual, in order to highlight the essence of the liturgy. This will bring us to the last section of presentation music and spirituality. I would like to start by asking this question. Can music really make a difference to people's spirituality and prayer life? And can it perhaps be an instrument for change? Music and spirituality are closely interlinked. They have a centuries-long relationship, and you could say that music is the most spiritual art. In ancient Greek philosophy and theology, Pythagoras or Pythagore listed a number of elements to understand the laws of the universe, and these four elements are called quadrivium, which means fourfold way. These elements are arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. According to Pythagoras, music has the power to heal and change the emotion of human beings, and thus it was counted among these elements. The Syriac Church Fathers also viewed music as a spiritual sacred art through which a faithful's body and soul is moved to spiritual levels and become closer to God. So here we see music as a bridge between the creator and us, his creation. But Abroyo, 
But Abroy's approach suggests that the music is an element of the metaphysical world and thus belong to the sphere of spiritual understanding. For him, the concept of music is when the sacred word is fused with the sound, it creates spiritual melodies. And when the faithful perform or sing these melodies, their body and soul are lifted up from the ordinary to a higher level of consciousness where they can attain the spiritual goals and reach to the, sp to, to the supernatural delight and passion. In Syriac we call it Hani Yutho Urethu Dal'ail Min Kyono. So given this theory, music and melodious voice is used as a middle stage instrument between the human and God. So this theory is reflected in the hymn called Kumfaus. It is sung on Saturday night service of the Shemo, the daily office. Here, I would like to post the image of him. Sorry, number again. <clears throat> Here we go. Where it says, Ashwan mor desmar sharbayhum tqadishe dahbukh khuldorin wa seqin alraumu dashmayo dithbaqe bshufrud nasihi habli mor desur tarif shufrayhun wakhmu damsaynu e qalis inun wahwelukh kainur qinuthu wizmarlukh shubhu tukhrunayhu It translates Make me worthy, Lord, that I may sing like the generations of saints who loved you during all ages. Lift me up into the heights of the sky to behold the virtuous beauty of the glorious one. Grant me, O Lord, to picture their beauty in my mind. I shall magnify them as much as I can. I shall be a harp of praise and shall praise you in remembrance of your saints. So here I would like to um, complement this uh, theory with a story of a saint called St. Hermes who lived in the ninth century. St. Hermes was um, a very good man and faithful man. And he was accused of a crime or a sin that he did not commit. And the king of that time ordered um, for St. Hermes to be killed. And then when the king and his soldiers went to where St. Hermes and his students were living, they told him to come out because he committed sin and therefore he has to be punished. St. Hermes had no choice but to pray to God. And the story says when he was praying, his soul and his body, in Syria we call it nafshu, not the far, not the, not the body, uh, like the physical body, but the body nafshu, was going from, a, from an earthly level to a higher spiritual level. And then the angels coming down from heaven met him somewhere in between the heaven and earth and conveyed his prayers to God so God can hear him. And he was praying a hymn that was composed by St. Ephraim. Then God heard St. Hermes' prayers, and then he revealed to the king and his soldiers that this man was innocent, and he did not commit that crime or that sin. During all this movement, all these motions, no one saw that his soul was moving, leaving his body. And then, when the whole thing was done, then the king believed that this man was innocent, and he believed in him and his God. So this story shows that the music can be used as a bridge, as an instrument between us and our creator through which we can become closer to God. And that's why whenever we pray, we pray with beautiful melodies so our soul can move, can go to, to higher spiritual levels. And thus, all three forefathers composed their hymns and their melodies to feed this narrative. I would like to emphasize this theory that Syriac chant is like a sacred icon of the Syriac liturgy. A minimalist musician, John Taverner, who is still alive, who composed music for several movies, and in one of his movie compositions, he made use of St. Ephraim's poem of the Nativity called Thunder Entered Her. Taverner describes Syriac chant as a small and only window in a dark room through which one can see the beauty of God. Tavener likened his previous life as a dark room before his conversion to orthodoxy and a window to see God's beauty upon his conversion as a new meaningful hope was born for the remaining of his life. I think it's reasonable to say that the presence of forms, styles, and orga organizations of music employed in the liturgy could be expression of the Syriac liturgical structure and Syriac theology, as well as character that influence the believer's faith. Before I conclude my um, 
talk, I would like to have a youth member to sing the following hymn for us. I think that would be um, Joe Koki, the, the son of Abuna Jangoki from Florida. Shlomo George. Shlomo Shamosho. How are you? Either what? How are you? Okay. So go ahead and read it for us. Please. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, sing, it. Yes. sing it for yeah, us. Okay. And a case of a seco, Rihodema, Yoda Ferro, Meta Shane, Yohev, Tarafi Fire, Kadashoa, Kmo. Tell you, Sagi George, that was beautiful. And this hymn translates If through the fragrant, fragrant water and soil a broken twig revives and produces leaves and fruits as it grows, how much more so will the departed who died in Christ? By his body and blood they will be raised and acquire everlasting. So what a beautiful hymn, which summarizes the definition of being a faithful Christian and receiving Jesus Christ's blood and flesh as food unto eternal life. With that, I would like to conclude my talk with a prayerful hymn of St. Ephraim, who considers praise as an essential or even prime factor in the life of every believer. For he saw that it is the duty of both man and woman, young and old alike, to offer praise to the Lord. Take, for example, the following hymn devoted for, uh, to the Easter celebration, where the voices of infant boys and girls, the young men and women, were loudly and clearly heard in the public liturgical celebration. It is claims this joyful festival is entirely made up of tongues and voices. Innocent young women and men surrounding like trumpets and horns, while infant girls and boys resemble harps and lyres. Their voices intertwine as they reach up together towards heaven, giving glory to the Lord glory. Blessed is he for whom the silent have thundered, and this is an Ephraim's Madrosho on the resurrection number two. Todi, thank you very much, and now I can take some questions. I hope you enjoyed his short presentation. Thank you so much, Shamosha. Definitely learned a lot. Um, yes, we do have a few questions. Um, yes. So one of them came a few times. So, um, so can you give, and maybe the Abuna is, of course, the clergy, can you give more insight about when instruments were introduced into our liturgy? Um, was it always a part of it, or did it become introduced? And then why were they again taken out? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, let me try to give you uh, a, a thorough answer uh, to this question. Well, it's not really an easy uh, question to answer, but I'll try my best. Um, so why the use of musical instruments uh, was banned from being used in the liturgy? Um, well, different reasons are provided uh, for banning the use of musical instruments during worship. Uh, first, we have to look um, at the era before um, the emergence of Christianity. Uh, musical instruments and music practice in general was also important um, in the Jewish worship until the destruction of the Second Temple. Um, with the destruction of the Second Temple, um, all, music, all instrumental music, both religious and secular, was banned because it was uh, described as disrespe disrespectful uh, when the Jews were supposed to bring the fall of the Temple. Uh, this notion in time has created um, hostility or antagonism uh, towards the non-religious music and musical instruments in general and even art for that matter. All these were regarded as profane or uh, disrespectful to be used in the worship activities, as worship activities. Thus, all instrumentation, dancing, um, and body motions and uh, mo of any kind were considered heathen or pagan worship practice and therefore were banned. Uh, we see a similar approach by the church father, forefathers toward 
the non-religious music or musical instrument. Um, in addition to these factors, church fathers added a couple other reasons to ban the use of musical instruments in worship. The first reason is connected to Judaism and, again, the Jewish worship. In the hymn uh, we studied earlier, where it says, Beit Marku Shalem Kulen Ati Chotho, we see that Jesus teaches his disciples not to make use of any elements or practices from the Old Testament, because Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament. Therefore, animal sacrifice and all other practices must be stopped must come to end. Since the musical instruments were created from the skin and horns of these sacrificed animals, church forefathers banned, banned them and did not want such elements or material to, uh, that had to do with the sacrifices to be a part of the Christian worship. And the second reason is associated with a Syriac hymnographer called Bardaisan, who lived in the second century. Bardaisan was born as a pagan, and then he embraced Christianity and was ordained as a deacon and perhaps priest. This is what we read um, uh, at the uh, Scattered Pearls, a relic theory of Morinatios from Barcelona. Uh, but because he was becoming involved in false pagan doctrines, he was renounced by the church. Also, St. Ephraim states that Bardaisan took Syriac hymns and changed the text and added unorthodox doctrine and teachings to them. And Bardaisan also added his own charming tunes or melodies and taught them to the youth of Edessa. So this act created in the youth immoral and unchristian behavior, and therefore they were banned. Also, uh, we learn from some poems that Bardaisan wanted to imitate David, the psalmist, by accompanying his chants with musical instruments, perhaps a harp, lyre, or percussion instruments. Since the church renounced Bardaisan, all his chants and musical instruments that accompanied his chants were banned also. So the last reason, I believe, is that because the church fathers perceived singing as the highest form of human expression, as I said it earlier. So human voice or music is a gift of God and part of his creation. Therefore, it should be used mainly to praise God unceasingly, continuously. But we see that Syriac uh, church fathers use musical instruments metaphorically, right? In the poetry, we see um, uh, the, the use of musical in instrument. Many hymns reflect the use of musical instrument, for example, in the uh, hymn that contained again in the Shemo, the daily office, where it says, which translates, Behold, the watchers on high give ear to the voice of the service of those on earth, and they say, How sweet is the voice of the children of the earthly Adam, who sing praise with harps of the Spirit and offer thanksgiving. Here we see that the use of harps of the spirit refers to vocal music, to human vocal, human voice. And there's also um, another feature uh, um, which is crucial to um, uh, mention about this hymn. This hymn accentuates a crucial point that the participation of the whole church in chanting with one voice and harmony to praise God is essential. So communal or collective singing is one of the primary characteristics of Syriac music. The majority of hymns contained in the Syriac chant repertory are composed to fit these concepts. So this feature is noticed not only in the structure of traditional hymns of the Bethgazo, uh, but also um, stress in the hymn text. So um, I believe um, nowadays we use some musical instruments here in our worship. And I do that uh, especially in our church here in Rhode Island. And our priest um, is uh, totally fine uh, with it. And the main reason that I am um, encouraging uh, to use one musical instrument during our worship is as the, the following. Since our community, choir members, or um, 
the, the deacons and everyone, they don't have musical background. Therefore, it's crucial to accompany our chanting, our singing with one musical instrument to play in the background. So the entire choir, the entire uh, assembly can stay in the same tonality. So they won't change, you know, they won't jump from mode to another. This is very important. But after um, they uh, get familiar, you know, uh, themselves with this concept, then we can elim eliminate that musical instrument. But until uh, to that, to, to reach to that point, I believe it um, will be helpful to use one um, instrument uh, uh, to accompany our chanting. But again, not in a way that makes uh, or uh, make use of different musical instruments and create a band you know, during uh, the divine liturgy. Not, that's, the, that's not the point. Only one musical instrument to help us, you know, stay in the same tonality, help us in chanting. But again, if we have um, like recitals or spiritual nights, yes, then I would encourage uh, youth members or deacons to to play different musical instruments to accompany to accompany their. Thank you. Um, Chris had a question. Go ahead. Shalom Hashem Osho. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. So I have a question uh, regarding what you were talking about and specifically when you mentioned that hymns and melodies are an instrument to get closer to God, yes. and specifically our Syriac uh, hymns and melodies. So uh, my question is from the point of view uh, from church members who don't understand the Syriac language. And I wanted to ask, is there a difference in the spiritual experience of chanting hymns in Syriac if we don't uh, you know, understand exactly what we're chanting versus listening to the chants like during the liturgy or even um, listening to the daily prayers and then reading the translations in our native tongues like, is there one that maybe is that you would recommend let's say from your point of view well here is the um, um, answer to your question definitely we prefer to have him sung chanted in Syria. And we would love to see the cantors or the chanters, choirs, deacons, learn uh, the language, learn the Syriac Aramic language and chant these hymns um, as they read the text in Aramic language. As I mentioned earlier, these are two crucial elements which are mixed and we cannot separate, you know, the text from the music. Um, in order to fully understand theological meaning behind the text. It's very important to understand the text very well. And in order to be able to do that, we have to read it and pronounce it correctly. I know that we live um, uh, in a century where it's very difficult for everyone to learn the language and read and chant, you know, while reading the text are made. Uh, and we prefer, you know, using uh, transliteration, chant our hymns. But honestly, we can do it if if you want to. For example, we go to church every Sunday and we chant the same hymns every Sunday over and over again. And I think if you take five or ten minutes a week to revise one hymn, the text of one hymn, and try to learn how to read that hymn in Syriac, I think we can. And chanting um, or singing hymns in our mother tongue, Aramaic, I believe it's very, very important. Not only we preserve the melodies, but also we preserve the Aramaic language. We learn it, and then we can teach it to our children as well. Therefore, I would say it's very important, of course, if we can, to, um, to learn the language while hymns and read the text you know, in Syriac rather than in uh, English or Latin. Um, the other thing, when we read a hymn, um, in Syriac, we, 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 we feel differently than reading it, you know, uh, in, in English uh, words or English alphabet. The way we um, uh, chant hymns in, in, in Syriac language is very important. It's, it's very crucial. It uh, makes us understand what the church forefathers had in mind when they composed these hymns. And to answer your um, other, uh, your other ha have the question, can we sing the hymn melodies, right, in English uh, text, English translation? I think that was your second question, right? 
Yeah, it's uh, so we can listen to it while it's being chanted in Syriac while reading the translation. Okay. Well, um, before I do, uh, before I answer that, also I would like to say that uh, singing hymns in English, in English translation, yes, is crucial, is important for our youth to understand the meaning and sing the hymns in English rather than the Syriac language. But honestly, I don't, I don't encourage. I would prefer. Um, having our youth singing chants in Syriac and read the translation if they if they want to know the meaning of that text, but chanting in Syriac in in uh, text in, in in Aramaic language at court. To answer your question, um, yes, we can listen, you know, um, to a chanting by others and read the, the read the translation. That's that's fine, but it's very important, as the Church for Father, you know, stated that we have to participate in chanting. Like when we go um, to church on Sunday, we have to have an active role in the liturgy, not a passive role. We don't go there just to sit down and listen and what others are doing. We go there to pray, to become a part of the community. So all together can pray, can sing to God. This is very important. And that's why when we look at um, Syriac hymns, all of them, mo mostly all of them, are formed, are created to, to feed the concept of collective singing. Yes, in some hymns, in some madroshe, we have a solo, then we have a refrain. But most of the hymns are formed through a simple form, so everyone can sing together. The hymn I, I read uh, towards the end of my presentation, in that hymn shows that the angels, okay, in heaven are very happy to see us all singing together collectively. And that's why I would say definitely if you if you are if you're attending a, a worship, a liturgy, just try to join them in chanting. This is very important. Would give you definitely a different sense um, of the prayer and would definitely would get you closer to God rather than just listening to what other, you know, singing. Again, when you sing, it's different than when you listen to someone else. Listening is important too, but chanting and participating, I think it's more. I hope I was able to answer your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we have Sayyid and John wanted to share. What more Sayyid now? Sayyid, you can. There you go. Taudi, Taudi, Shamosho, Taudi, Sagi. I'm not going to, to, to ask any question, but I would like to, to, to say something that I was so happy when our youth started uh, this uh, Bible study session. But uh, I'm thankful to you, Shamosho, when you called me asking me to give uh, what you gave us today. Because uh, for this is I wanna, I wanna uh, raise awareness here among our our uh, uh, youth. Uh, Bible is essential. It's very important. We are serious and we are well known to the whole world by our father, our father, our liturgy, our music, and our sacred language. So today, when I was hearing Shamosho Gabriel, I asked Tanya also to, to ask somebody else, I'm not going to mention his name, to give us something about why we have to read our church father. It is very, very important. And this is also essential. You know, even the Bible came to us through our tradition and our forefathers. So it's, it's very important to focus on the, on the Bible. And no one is allowed to not to read the Bible. Also, we have to know our uh, uh, church. And in order to know our church, we have to know our father and our liturgy and of course our uh, uh, language so we always repeat the same subject what does it mean to be serioyo to be real serioyo we have to 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 know our father to know our liturgy to get to know our uh, music and i'm not seeing it because shamosh gabriel is here can shamosh gabriel know that i I'm really interested and I used to have a, maybe the best choir in Syria. So okay. we have to, to get to know our, our music and, and our language. So again, Shamosho, God bless you, your family, and thank you, Taudi Sagi, 
for your presentation. Thank you very much, Todi Ghalabi Abu Nhasyu. Just one uh, more thing to add to what Abu Nhasyu has mentioned. Um, he is um, uh, definitely right uh, when saying that we have to read uh, the, the works uh, done by our forefathers. It's very, very important, like especially like St. Ephraim, St. Jacob, and others. Through their writings, through their poetical wars, we learn about our faith, about our about liturgy and our Christian faith, theology. Even in the Catholic Church, whenever whenever they reach to a level where they don't know how to find an answer to a question that a theological question that they have, they go back to St. Ephraim's poems. Read, they read through his poems to try to find an answer to their question, to their theological question. So, and today, even today, uh, in most of the professional institutions, universities in America and around the world, they teach about St. Ephraim's works. And we as Syria Christians, we own St. Ephraim. He is one of us and from and within us. So we have to learn about him. We have to read his works. And honestly, through his work, we learn everything that we have, uh, that we desire to learn. Christianity, liturgy, music, faith, theology. He is one of the best theologians who was able to describe, to ex explain the Trinity, Clitho Yutho, through his poems. Not even like describing it, just through poems. And until today, all our faith, our theology is based on their these uh, church fathers' writing. That was beautiful. Say that. Taudi, Taudi, Shamosh, Taudi. Here again, Shamosh. Who is going to pray? Mina will pray. Um, and Yalla I also Mina. texted you a hymn, Shamosh, if you could look and um, add that at the end. Someone requested that. I'm sorry, what is that? I texted you a hymn that George had asked if you. you know, okay. We'll have Mina pray um, for us. Go ahead, Mina. Barakumursayina. Thank you so much, Shamosh. Abshaino. Nakio with Wabaidoi. I did good shone of the women. Was it a poet? Wombedro. Nakio with Oh, <laughs> 
قديش قديشات وبارا وهوات هود يا بلان فار ودمين قديش قديشات وبارا وهوات هود يا بلان فار ودمين قديشات So the Sagi Shama, so that was beautiful. What's your name? Uh, what was your name again? Mina, thank you. Mina, Mina thank from you. Tampa. All our talents today is, are from Tampa. So Mina, you know um, the 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 solo part. That's my composition, right? You know I, that. I heard. Actually, I figured. I found out today. Actually. <laughs> so <laughs> if you allow me, I, I fell in love me, with this the first time uh, I heard if you, it. If you allow mm -hmm. me, I would love to to conclude uh, with a prayer. Go ahead. I would like to to thank our Almighty Lord for all His blessings and for giving us a lot of talent within our holy Syriac church. We thank you, Lord, for giving us our forefathers, our saint forefathers, for giving us a beautiful music and liturgy. And we ask you, Lord, at the end of this wonderful session, to bless each and everyone, to bless all our families, and to deliver us from every temptation and we ask you lord to hear us when we cry out to you and say abun bashmayo net qadash shmokh ti thamal kuto nehwa subyonokh ay kanut bashmayo of bara ablan lahmut sunqonan yawmono washbuklan hawbayn wa hatuayn ay kanut of hnan shbaqin al hayubayn blot ala an nasiuno ila fasalan bisho metul dilo khimal kuto haylo tishbuhto العالم والمين امين تودي تقول